Good morning. It's good to see you today. Boy, what a beautiful day outside. Great day to come to church on. Great day to fellowship on. We're going to be receiving a communion together as a church body in just a moment. Uh, in fact, you know, uh, when it comes to communion at Believer's Fellowship, it's not something we tack on to the service. It is the service. The Bible says the Lord Jesus spoke as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So we take this whole service just to commit it to the Lord, to remember all that he's done for us and the sacrifice that it took that you and I might come to know him as our Lord and Savior. So I'll be talking a little bit about the communion service in itself. Uh, what is it? Uh, and this is a pretty simple explanation. What we're doing today is uh, I, I want to read you a passage where the Apostle Paul is receiving instruction from the Lord. And I would dare say almost every time we've received the Lord's Supper, this passage has been read. But it, uh, it's familiar to you, but it needs to be even more familiar to you. The apostle writes, I've got my little switch button here somewhere. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, For as I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, The cup, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Every time that we receive the Lord's Supper together, that's the anthem. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Today, this message is a proclamation of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. In our church, we basically celebrate and honor two sacraments of the New Testament. Now, I know in some churches there seems to be a lot more sacraments. But in, in Scripture, biblically, there's just two that the Lord has instituted himself for the church. One is this and the other is baptism. And they are both symbolic. Baptism representing this new life we receive when we come to give our life to Jesus. The Lord tells us that once we've come to know him as our personal Lord and Savior, Scripture makes it clear that we should follow the Lord in this public testimony, this public confession called baptism. It doesn't save us, but it is a demonstration of what the Lord has done for us. That we have died to an old life and an old person, and we've come alive in Jesus Christ. Just as he died and was buried for our sins, rose on the third day, there's a great picture of how we are dead to our sins now, and we rise and we come alive and we're now in Jesus Christ and we celebrate a new walk and a new life. That's the first sacrament. The other is this sacrament of, of the Lord's Supper. And it doesn't mean when we say sacred or sacrament that there's something in either one of these that will save you or make you more holy or somehow impute some kind of righteousness to you. They're both a message. Baptism is a message. The Lord's Supper is a message. All in symbols of his greatness, of his grace, of his blessings, of his power to redeem, of his, the change that he does in our lives. And so when we celebrate these different events in our church, we, we want to give full attention to what's really going on and what it really means. So I find it often good to refresh our thinking. The Apostle Peter says, I, I stir up your, your minds, your pure minds by way of remembrance. In other words, I want you to remember what this is all about. Jesus said, as often as you do this, remember. So let's remember some things. In fact, when I was preparing for this in the Lord's Supper, looking through the scripture, you, you, you start realizing there's really, there's about four different names in the, in the scripture for this ordinance. And I want to look at each one of those names that it's called by in the word of God because Although they're all the same thing, they all allude to the same thing, just by the very name used in the context of that passage, there's a message for us in regard to the Lord's Supper. And I think if we're going to remember the Lord and all he's done for us, this is certainly a good way to go back and refresh ourselves from the scripture of just what it means. In Acts chapter 2, it's called the breaking of bread. It's the same thing as the Lord's Supper. It says in Acts 2.42 that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. 
early church disciples, this was common between them that there would be, yes, in Jerusalem, there were meals that were shared in context. It kind of went on to many other churches as well that a meal would be served. Those who didn't have as much to, to especially in Jerusalem because of the persecution of the church in that first century, it would come and this might be a, a meal that they could participate in for their families and for them for just basic sustenance. But following that, that fellowship meal would be the Lord's Supper, would be the, what they called the breaking of, of bread. And it was a time when they'd get together, they'd remember what the Lord had done for them. It was a time of fellowship. Acts 20, verse 7, you see this incident again in the early church where the apostle Paul, he's, he's in trials for seven days there. And at the end of this mission and ministry that he's on, he gathers everybody together and they receive the Lord's Supper together. It's an important part of our Christian life. We do it in our church in services like this. We do it in different retreats that we do. Our men's retreat, we'll share the Lord's Supper. Anytime the women's retreat, the couple's retreat, different retreats that we share. We do it with the youth at different times. We've had the Lord's Supper. Sometimes in your, your ministry group, your, your lift group, you'll share the Lord's Supper. But it's an important time because it's that time when we really begin to, to reflect on all that the Lord has done for us. Where we would be without him, what, where we are because of him and the grace we got. The breaking of bread. But another name that's given to it in scripture, it's the Lord's Supper, which we refer to it here. Therefore, he says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now he's talking about their meetings they were having at Corinth that kind of gotten out of hand. And the people were uh, coming in and eating and gorging themselves and then trying to, you know, and there was such disunity in the fellowship. There was drunkenness, all kinds of problems were going on. And in 1 Corinthians 10 and 20, Paul's correcting their behavior. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. But he calls it here, when you've gathered, is it not for the Lord's Supper? Matthew 26, you see the Lord Jesus. It's Passover. It's the last Passover that he'll celebrate with them. He's celebrated several. In fact, he says, it starts out that passage, that I have longed or I have desired to have this fellowship, this Passover meal with you. Because it's at that Passover that he's going to clearly explain where he's getting ready to go in regards to the cross and what it all means. He very clearly is making, I think, a, a clear emphasis upon the, upon the mark and, and the point that the Passover meal, even though it symbolized deliverance for the, is, the people of Israel from Egypt, and you remember those judgments that fell upon the, the house of Egypt because they wouldn't let the people of God go, that that last judgment with that the firstborn child in every home dying, except those whose houses were marked with the blood from the lamb that had been splattered and sprinkled upon the doorpost and how the people that night took that slain lamb, prepared it into a meal, and all these elements that were a part of the Passover meal all spoke of the mercy, the judgment, the grace, the, the, the glory, the deliverance of God. And so the, all the Jews from all over the known world were gathering in Jerusalem anyway at this time of year. Jesus and the disciples also come to town. They're in the upper room. We're having this meal together. And then at the end of the Lord's Supper, and we talked about this about a month and a half ago or two months ago when we did the Lord's Supper last, Jesus takes one of the four cups that was part of the Passover meal, the cup of redemption. And he takes that cup and he says, this cup is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you. And he makes it clear that this message, this is, this is the Lord's Supper, that these elements of the bread and of the wine, they were an important part uh, of the Passover, but more more so because it clearly demonstrates not just there was a deliverance for the Jews from the Egyptians, but there was deliverance for you, there was deliverance for me through the, through, the, through the grace of God because of Jesus Christ who would come and give himself as that sacrificial lamb at Passover. He was our sacrificial lamb and his blood was spilt for, on our behalf and his body was given. So he says, when you come together, as often as you do this, you need to remember me. Well, how often should we remember him? Well, I, I think that as often as we do the Lord's Supper, I think the, you could even broaden that up. Every time we sit down to eat bread and drink, <laughs> it ought to remind us of the grace of God and what the Lord has done for me and what the Lord has done for you. It ought to be a startling reminder. We, we, we bow our heads at, at, at meals in my home or even when we're out in public. Many of you do the same. You stop for that moment. You thank God. But in that thinking of God, let's always remember, we wouldn't be able to even thank God if it wasn't for Jesus giving up the bread of his life, his life, his body for us. And we wouldn't even be able to have a relationship to call him father if it weren't for the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So especially when we come to this time, the Lord's Supper, 
It's remembering that it's about the Lord. It's the Lord's Supper. They don't call it supper because it's at nighttime. It, it followed Passover, which was supper, so to say. It was an evening meal. So whether we celebrate it in the morning or evening is not relevant. The fact is that we remember the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything about this reminds us of what he's done for us. The third thing that the Lord's Supper is called in Scripture is called the table of the Lord. He says in 1 Corinthians 10, still correcting the Corinthians, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. So what he's dealing with here and making a very clear point to deal with, especially in the case of the Corinthians, and I think even so in the, our day and age, I think the church more closely relates to Corinth than any other church in history. He's dealing with our behavior. You can't find your life and your fellowship and your joy in the world and expect to have life and joy and fellowship with the Lord. He's saying you can't, you can't have this both ways. You can't love God and then also love the world. He says you can't take of the cup of demons. And he's talking about participation. This communion has to do with fellowship, where we live our life, where we find our excitement, where we look for joy, where we look for fullness. What's important to you is what's, what comes down here. Do you think that you can go out and live for yourself is the message and then come in and take the cup of the Lord? Because if this says anything, it means I'm dying to myself. Just as Christ died to himself and for us, it means I died to myself and for him. He says, you can't do both of those things. You can't partake the Lord's Supper. First, verse 27 of 1 Corinthians says, if you eat this bread and you drink this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, catch this, you'll be guilty of the blood you'll be guilty of the body of the Lord. So one thing we always encourage people is to have our hearts right, not just for this moment, but in our lives, to keep our hearts clean. We all stumble, James made it very clear, we all stumble in many ways, but we don't stay there. We move forward from there. We confess our sins, we get right with God, and we're moving, we're progressing towards God. He said, but listen, he said, this is, this is the cup of the Lord, and you cannot take this in an unworthy manner. I guess the first question most people come to is, say, Brother Joe, I'm just not worthy. How, how can I take the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner? I'm not worthy. He's not talking about you being worthy. This is an adverb. King James says, worthily. It, it describes the manner in which you take it. I love when you go back and you read in Matthew and in the Gospels where it's talking about the Lord's Supper. It says in Jesus, he took the bread and he broke it and he gave thanks. And it says, in like manner, he took the cup. Well, what was the manner in which Jesus took it? He's standing on the precipice of the cross. He's standing at the point of absolute surrender. He's standing at the place where it's not my will, but thy will, Father, be done. This, this, this manner that's described me, I, I believe it's this manner of humility. And I think it's where you talk about the cup of demons and the, and the cup of the Lord. Your, your heart needs to be right. It's, it's not that, that, uh, that you're, the, you're special enough or you're worthy enough. You know, a lot of people say, well, I'm just not worthy to take the Lord's Supper. Well, you're not even worthy to be saved. <laughs> it's called grace. Amen? I'm just not worthy. I just don't want to take it. Oh. He's saying, I'm, my heart is humble. My heart is appreciative. My heart is grateful. My heart is surrendered. My, my life is in his hands. I, wanna, I want my heart to be right with you today. That's, that's the manner that's being described here as you receive the Lord's Supper. This is interesting because I think some people miss this point. They, they kind of, I've had pastors say, well, who's, you know, I, I, I've had this question asking pastors' conferences. Uh, you know, I have this couple in my church and I, don't, I think they're really right with the Lord or something's going on in their life. And should I let them take the Lord's Supper? I'd let him know there's no place in Scripture where the pastor's called the Lord's Supper police. <laughs> All right? Who's the police over the Lord's Supper? You are. Let every man judge himself. Did you catch that? Look at my own heart. He said, now, as you do it, be careful. You take this in a worthy manner. You know, there could be sickness, death, all these problems you're going to have in your life. Hey, why, why is there such judgment pronounced this? Because this represents our deliverance. The Bible says Jesus Christ came and was manifest to take away our sins. So why do we come to the table of the Lord holding all our sins and not willing to surrender them and then take the cup? He said, you don't want to do that. So judge yourself. 
How do I judge myself? Well, if I see things that in my life that aren't right, I get them right. How do I get them right? I go to the cross. I go to the Lord. I praise God for the promise of 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, that God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's worthy. That, that's, that's praiseworthy, is it not? So it's, it's a matter of not who should partake, it's how we partake. And then the, the fourth and the last one, I will make this point up before we share it together, it's called communion. All right? It, it says in 1 Corinthians 10, the cup of blessing which we bless is not, the, is not this the communion of the blood of Christ, the bread which we break, is, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Communion deals with fellowship. Communion deals with sharing in a common life. It's that koinonia concept that we are all part of the same body, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is, a, this is a, a meal as we remember Christ that celebrates what gives us unity. It's the cross. What makes us right, what brings us together, it's the blood of Jesus Christ, it's the cross of Jesus Christ. That's what gives us unity, that's what brings us together. That's what makes us one, we are family. Now there's some churches and even denominations that are restrictive and forbidding when it comes to people who can participate in sharing the Lord's Supper in the churches are their denominations. They say, if you don't belong to our group, then you can't participate in the Lord's Supper. It's called closed communion. I don't believe the Bible teaches closed communion. If you're part of the body of Christ, this, we all have this in common. We may feel different about tongues, we may feel different about the second coming, we may feel different about is different issues in scripture, but what unites us as one is this issue right here. This is what's making us one. It's the Lord's Supper. This is everything and demonstrates and symbolizes everything that has saved us and given us that one eternal home in heaven. I hate to tell you this, some of you think you're gonna have a little mansion on a hilltop. Because you read that King James Version which says, in my father's house are many mansions. I love King James, but that's not a good translation. In my father's house, one house, are many rooms. Many dwelling places in that house. So get used to it. <laughs> Some of you have trouble in here with, with everybody once a week. <laughs> what about every day? Get used to it, but not just with, but with every child of God. When I first started doing pastor's conferences in, in, the, in Eastern Europe, in Bulgaria, we have around 600 pastors, that probably about, there was only about five or 600 churches. So we have 600 pastors and their wives that would come to this conference. But we did it over two weeks. And the reason we did it over two weeks is because half of the church in Bulgaria would not take the Lord's Supper with the other half. And we always closed every conference out with the Lord's Supper. Well, you know, they're not spiritual because they don't do this or they don't have this or they do that or whatever it might be. They drew the lines. And so we do that way. You know, we get together at the end of the conference and, you know, we'd have the Pentecostal groups and everybody that fell under that banner. And then you'd have, you know, the, the Methodist and the Baptist and everybody that falls under those banners over here. And you'd have, you know, all these people together and you'd, you'd do the Lord's Supper. Now, Bulgaria, when we first started doing that, there was like one cup for 600 people, you know. <laughs> Brother Joe was always at the first line. <laughs> but as we progressed and God was moving and revival began to stir and people's hearts began to change, that only lasted a few years. And then we started bringing everybody together. And what revival broke out? What unity began to be established in the hearts of these people? Even though we had different unique concepts in regard, the main things were the main things that we all agreed on. That Jesus is Lord, risen from the dead. The word of God is the word of God. The Holy Spirit's come to change our lives. Jesus is coming again. The most important things were the most important things. We could make the main thing, and we dwelt on the main things, which is the lordship of Jesus Christ, the integrity and the authority of Scripture. But, I, you know, I think that's one of the reasons that instead of five or 600 churches in Bulgaria today, that there's now five or 6,000 churches in Bulgaria today because of the work that God did in people's hearts and lives. So I don't believe closed communion is, is, is what is intended in the scripture here because this all relates to the unity. We are all part of the body of Christ. We've all shared in the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And communion is one thing that all the church can share in together. Praise God, we're part of the family of God. Praise God for that. Don't you love when your family gets together and you're just all together, and you celebrate, you eat, and you fellowship one another. What about when the family of God comes together? So today we celebrate 
as a family of God at Believer's Fellowship. If you're a guest today and you know Jesus, you are more than welcome to participate in the Lord's Supper with us. It's not a closed communion here. You're part of the greatest family in the universe, and that's God's family. Now, let's think about it with me. First of all, communion is called the Lord's Supper. Why? Because the Lord is always first with us when we observe it, and he's the focus of everything. But it's also called the table of the Lord. That has to do with ownership. So whose table is this today? It's the Lord's table, all right? And if it's the Lord's table, then we need to come with an understanding that we're celebrating this in his presence, not drinking from the cup of demons, you know, but from the cup of the Lord. It's the Lord's table. So we want to come with a pure heart and a pure mind. The third thing it's called, you know, is communion. And the fourth thing we talked about was the breaking of bread. These are things that Jesus gives us very clearly to describe in Scripture what communion really is all about. But the goal, again, of everything that we're talking about is, he says, remember me. Remember me. So today, in just a moment, we're going to receive the Lord's Supper together. And the goal of why you're here in this service, and the goal of the service today, is to just put everything else out of your mind, put everything else out of your heart, and let's remember Christ. Let's remember him. This is what it's all about. We're not looking at anyone, anybody, anything, any situation. We're looking to the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're going to choose to remember him. So I'm going to ask that you would stand with me. One thing we always do before we receive the Lord's Supper is we have an invitation because I think we should come to the Lord with clean hearts and clean hands and clean lives. So we want to give this.